Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see such a, a big group from so many interesting places. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, uh, you know, wherever you are. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, my, uh, uh, not really guest, co-host, uh, John Torpy, um, who is president and general manager of Epiroc uh, USA. Uh, John will tell us a little bit about Epiroc in a minute, um, uh, because it's a very interesting company that's been through a, a a pretty interesting uh, couple of years. Uh, John uh, it has mining and, and construction in the blood. He grew up in a copper mining camp in Peru, uh, went to college and studied mining and mineral engineering, graduated in 1999 and joined uh, a company called Ingersoll Rand Drilling Solutions as an application engineer in 1999. And he's been with the same company, even though it's uh, changed its name a couple of times from uh, Ingersoll Rand Drilling to Atlas Copco and is now Epiroc. And he's risen steadily to become a, um, uh, a regional manager, uh, then a district manager, then a business line manager, uh, then vice president of marketing, and is now a president and general manager of Epiroc USA. Um, he's uh, been a strong advocate of innovation his entire career and has done some pretty interesting things at uh, Epiroc. So, uh, John, uh, uh, welcome. Um, yeah, great to be with you. Thanks. Thanks, David. Great to be here with everybody. And so my, my first question to you, John, is uh, just tell us a, a little bit about Epiroc. And I'm going to switch to this next slide here, which has uh, just some pictures of some of the cool stuff that you do. Great. Yeah. And we can and we can talk to the pictures as well, a little bit about our company. So it's kind of interesting. We are a, a four year old company that started in 1873. Uh, and so if you do the math, obviously, it doesn't line up. And so, as you said, uh, I'm, I'm kind of unique in that I've been with the same company for about 23 years. Uh, starting with Ingersoll Rand, but then we were acquired by Atlas Copco. And what happened within Atlas Copco is about four years ago, they decided to, to take one of their business units, spin it out and create a new company, a, a, a new publicly traded company uh, that was in turn uh, named Epiroc. And the idea with that was to create a new company that would grow better on its own than it was under this, this parent company of Atlas Copco. So we created Epiroc and essentially doing the same, same things that we were doing under Atlas Copco, but as a standalone company. Uh, what we do is we're a solutions and productivity uh, provider to the mining and construction industry. We do that as an equipment manufacturer, uh, as a provider of digitalization, automation, parts and services. Uh, and, and we do that with customers in the mining and construction industry worldwide. Uh, we, we have a presence in about 150 countries, and that, that includes our, our own wholly owned companies uh, in those countries, uh, global, so very global company. Uh, we're a Swedish company, so we are listed and headquartered uh, in Sweden and based out of Stockholm. Uh, in terms of size of the company, we're about uh, $4 billion, uh, depends on the, the, the conversion where we, we work in Swedish Krona, so about $4 billion. Uh, uh, Good profitability, 22.7% operating profit, uh, healthy in terms of cash flow, paying dividends, and uh, yeah, overall, just uh, uh, like you said, it's it's actually quite an interesting company that many people haven't heard of, partially because we are a relatively new company, but also coming from that heritage that started back in, in 1873. And it says here you you uh, develop uh, drill rigs, excavation and construction equipment, tools for surface and underground applications. But I, I think that doesn't um, uh, capture really the sophistication of what you're doing. Uh, a lot of it, for example, is um, is remote automation so that you don't actually have to be at a drilling site to manage one of these huge machines that you make. Yeah, yeah that's right. You know, if you if you look at, uh, at at the transition and the transformation that's happened in the mining and construction industries and and you see, you know, even going back a decade and then and then look trying to look forward a decade. Uh, you know, you, you try to anticipate the challenges and decide, okay, how are we going to continue to be the solutions provider as, as that evolution takes place? And one thing that's that's really clear, you know, these are these operations are quite sophisticated, they're big, and so there's there's a lot of ambition to be as data driven as possible and leverage that data to to run uh, at high levels of efficiency in in commodity businesses. And, and in a commodity business, you know, you you live or die based on the efficiencies that you can bring into your operation. And so we work to, to be a partner with those customers to do that. It's customers like HP, Rio Tinto, Freeport, McMoran. 
And one of the key pieces there is what's happening with, with automation and, uh, and digitalization. And automation in particular, if you look at, uh, for example, the, the utilization of mining equipment uh, tends to be, be fairly low. Uh, and, and that has to do with the, the, how, how labor intensive it is. Um, we always, uh, safety is always the priority and we're always making sure that we do things safely. And so the opportunities to begin automating functions uh, be, are, are quite relevant, uh, but also quite complex. And so we started automating, started creating robots uh, several years ago and really automating parts of the equipment, parts of the process and moving to where we start to automate the whole process. And, and what you can see here in the picture, those, those two drills, those are drills on the bottom left. They are drilling holes in a mine that will be, uh, they'll put explosives in those holes and they'll essentially break big rocks into small rock that will turn into copper uh, in that mine. Those machines weigh around 300,000 pounds each, uh, but they're robots. They, they, can, they are giving us a set of instructions and they can go out there and operate for uh, 12 hours, 24 hours, uh, hopefully without human interaction to go and deploy and, and execute against a mission that they're given. And then on the right in that picture, you can see actually uh, when a person does need to operate it, they can do that remotely, um, in some cases from more than uh, a thousand miles away if, if they have to. Yeah, there's kind of three surprising parts of your business for me. Um, one of them was the degree to which these uh, huge pieces of machinery are not just remote controlled, but also uh, automated uh, so that they can go for you know, 12 hours without human intervention. A second thing was how uh, electrified they are, how, how, battery, how many of your uh, products are battery powered. Um, why has that happened? You know, so this... Uh... It's interesting that if you look back in the history, the idea of, of electrification of mining equipment, it, it's, it, it's actually been out there a long time. Um, uh, it became old and then what's old is starting to become new again in terms of electrification. Uh, the, the change that's now happened is with battery technology, uh, the, the reason for the electrification. So, so there were reasons that it happened in the past and there was reasons that electrification stopped being as important and they went to uh, you know, diesel combustion engines, and now uh, again coming back to electrification. Uh, the, there's a couple of drivers. I think one of the main ones is you know these mining companies. Uh, they do try to be good stewards in the area that they work, and and uh, they are really working hard to be committed to this idea of decarbonization and doing what they can in terms of of uh, reducing the amount of carbon output that they have in their operations. Uh, battery and electrification is one piece of that, not the only piece. And, but, it's, but it's really, I think, over the past couple of years, uh, especially between the drive from industry to be more focused uh, on this and the technology that's happened with, with battery technology, which, which is a story that I think everybody's familiar with, it becomes very viable as an alternative in mining operations. So not only to to help them operate more efficiently, but at the same time, uh, reach these ambitions of decarbonization, reducing carbon footprint and things like that. And so it's really cool. I mean, this is, this is really neat stuff. I think one thing for everybody to know is uh, mining uh, and construction can take place on the surface, like you see in the picture there, but it can also take place underground. So when you're underground in a, in a, in a tunnel, uh, you know, getting rid of any sort of pollutants is, is a really good good thing as well. We don't just want to get rid of them on the surface. We also don't want them underground when we're operating. Yeah, you must be looking at that kind of trailing edge, um, a backward guy, Elon Musk and his uh, uh, electric yeah, vehicles uh, and thinking <laughs> it took him so long. But the, the, the third surprising part about of this is, you know, when I think about uh, this industry, you know, mining and drilling and, you know, I'm, I, I think of my son when he was seven years old and how much he would have loved you know, the big, loud, powerful machines and how kind of, you know, what a macho male industry it is. The third surprising thing to me about Epiroc is you have a female CEO. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about her? Yeah. So her name is Helena Hedblom. Um, look, she's awesome. I, I don't know. I mean, she's just, she's just an incredible, awesome leader. Uh, you know, she, she was kind of grew up within the company uh, and as the, and, and was kind of, you know, she, she, was trained in a lot. She has an engineering background, was trained in a lot of different areas. But when we decided to create this new public company, she was selected by our board to be that new CEO. And she hadn't been a CEO before. She had been a business unit president. 
Uh, but it was kind of a, you know, it was kind of an obvious choice because she's just this very uh, visionary, humble, great leader to help this new company, you know, that 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 is just starting off to really grow and thrive. And and Helena's been able to do that and through her leadership, help us to to really stay focused on the right things. Um, you know, and I think as well set this example that, you know, you, you use the words, you know, macho male industry, but the industry traditionally, it, you know, it did kind of have this uh, male dominance to it. And, and there's reasons for that. We, we, you know, we can look back and see that, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. And I think that's something that's really key is that uh, we don't have to accept the excuses of what happened in the past. We're totally free to to change how we want to impact the future. And as a company, you know, we can be a part of that impact in, in these industries. And so I think Helena believes in that. I think as a company, I think generally speaking, Swedish companies tend to be quite progressive on this front. And so it's interesting as, as an American right now running an American company to be a part of that because that standard is... Um, is a Swedish standard and expectation there. Plus we have this incredible leader in Helena that helps us uh, find a way to get there and set that example throughout the company that we're gonna find a way to do it and not make excuses for it. Okay, well, th thanks for that. Um, so how has the company been doing since, um, since it split off and since Helena took over? Really well, you know, so when this happens, the first thing everybody asks you for the first two years is did you do this to sell the company, right? So we. That, that's and I think that's uh, you know I don't know that that's an American view of why this would happen, but uh, there were a lot of questions about that, and uh, that that wasn't the intention. If you look at the ownership of our company, uh, uh, they 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 have a portfolio of companies and they want those companies to thrive and grow, and so that was the intention. If you look at what's happened, uh, you know the company has grown uh, revenue wise, it's grown profitability wise, uh, very. You know, clean balance sheet. Um, I think more importantly, what really shows how the company is doing is we've acquired over four years, I think, you know, 20 companies, maybe, maybe, maybe 21, 22 now. You know, we do we do so many that it's almost tough to keep track. But you know, we are acquiring companies. And so the way we grow and the way that we deliver on the commitment that EpiRock was created for uh, is is through that inorganic and organic. But I think the idea of the inorganic side, there's a lot of stuff that's happened there that really, I think, sends a clear message that we're going to grow. Uh, we want to be, we want this company to be around for 145 years, just you know, just like uh, Atlas Copco, who we were spun out of. And so everything we do is kind of with that long-term vision of uh, sustainable, profitable growth and ensuring that, that we run a good business that allows us to do that. Um, and our and our industries are cyclical, so you have to plan. Uh, you have to be pretty disciplined and and run a run a good business all the time so that you can manage the cyclicality of the businesses that, that we serve. Yeah, and it, you've uh, it, you've had both some um, headwinds and tailwinds. Uh, you know, you've had some pretty uh, uh, impressive growth and uh, a healthy operating margin, um, in part because you've. Uh, You've been at the right place at the right time. I mean, uh, as we have supply chain difficulties, uh, you're the cure for some of these things, right? I mean, you, uh, uh, you know, if if people are having trouble getting enough raw materials, then they need more mining and construction equipment. So um, you are the cure to some supply chain um, uh, problems. But uh, what uh, what have been the negative headwinds that you've faced? You've, I'm sure you've faced some of the supply chain problems of your own trying to make enough equipment to satisfy demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supply chain is the gift that keeps giving right now. Uh, you get one problem solved and then something else pops up. Uh, and I think that's something that we just, we are constantly working on. And I think you just expect there's going to be something else. And, and you're right, you know, our ability to help the natural resource industry uh, deliver the raw materials helps the whole cycle uh, recover. You have the complications of UK, Ukraine and Russia. We have companies uh, in both, uh, and, and Russia, of course, a, a big supplier of raw materials. Ukraine as well. Ukraine also a supplier of uh, what I'd say other other components that many companies use, not just EpiRock. And so uh, that's certainly been a headwind and navigating that uh, COVID. You know, figuring our, out our way through COVID, and I think even going back while we were doing all that, we were also creating a new company, and so making sure that you do the right things to ensure that uh, the company 
still thrives despite these headwinds. And so, and so I think a lot of companies have, have the headwinds, supply chain, Russia, the one, the, the additional one that we have is, is try, was trying to make sure that this, this, this infant company really grows up and, and thrives and, and those headwinds don't overcome us. And so, yeah, there was a lot of effort into making sure we didn't lose momentum there. And I think overall, uh, you know, I can say for the company that I run in the U.S., which is a pretty sizable company, uh, just incredible to see what people can do when they pull together and, and work on a strategy. Because our, our, our employees, our strategy, uh, uh, they were the right ones. And uh, the best way I can put it is we didn't miss a beat. You know, it just, we just made things happen. And it was pretty amazing, amazing to see. Well, let's move to innovation. Um, part of the reason um, I wanted to talk to you today uh, was that you've been innovating in a pretty interesting way, that you still are making the core products that you've been making since you joined the company back in 1999. Um, but you're also realizing that that may not be enough to really serve your customers. So how would you describe your innovation strategy? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, to... To, to kind of make it simple, I think the the idea is that you know we were an equipment manufacturer, and and you're not going to be able to be around in 140 years uh, at certainly at the profitability levels that, that that we expect if you just build and sell dumb iron. I think that's the term I'll use is, is dumb iron. That all it is is a piece of iron that goes out there and does the work. It has to be more than that. And it has to be more than this transaction of selling a piece of equipment or servicing a piece of equipment. It has to go closer and, and further into that. How do you partner with the companies uh, that you work with to, to offer a more holistic solution to their problems, but, but really that goes beyond this idea of, of dumb iron. And so looking at how do you do that and, and even change how, how you are as perceived as just an equipment manufacturer to be more than that, but also to show that you can do it, right? That you can also be a robotics company, that you can also be a, a company that understands data and, and what to do with data and where you can identify opportunities for digitalization and things like that. And so that's been a, a big part uh, of what we've been doing. So to, to, to keep that core going, because we will always be a manufacturing company, as far as I know, for, for equipment, but what else goes with it? And, and that it can't just you can't just rely on the idea of this of this iron being uh, the product in the portfolio. Yeah. So moving from uh, big dumb iron to uh, intelligent solutions has meant uh, a multi-year effort to change the role of the product manager to be more of the CEO of the product. Um, tell us a little bit about what that meant and and the the challenge of a, of a, of that change that you faced when you tried to change the company that way. So some of this started, you know, when we were still Atlas Copco before we created EpiRock, you know, we had to start this journey. And so, and, and, and part of that, like my, my last role as marketing VP, uh, you know, I was, I was one of the crazy guys that said, oh yeah, we should just automate this and had to get people to buy into the fact that, oh, we, we can, we can do robotics. Um, I don't have a robotics background, but confidence that we could figure it out and get the right people involved and there had been some work already in our company, but how do you really pull it together into solution and, and ultimately commercialize it? Because that's, that's, that's what we're here to do. And so some of it had started, and I'll say it started kind of in, in a little bit of these smaller groups that, that realized this. We had some really innovative people in Sweden that came into the company. And, and so we had started in small pockets uh, around starting to be really, really good at that. Our company actually created a separate group to focus on technology, to bring that expertise in. And so those pieces were starting to happen. And, and I think that's a really good way to get started. But we, as we started to look at what do we want to be as EpiRock, we're going to create this new company and who do we want to be and what things do we want to bring with us from our 140-year-old history and what things do we want to do better or do new. And this was actually one of the top priorities was we need to, to kind of take a more holistic approach and, and more, more a broader approach in terms of the organization with how we look at our portfolios and do portfolio management. And so we created a, we started with, we had some assumptions, I guess, some hypotheses, if you will. And, 
And uh, so we, we actually worked with Boston Consulting to come in and help us validate some of those hypotheses that we had, uh, pulled a lot of data together, did some surveys, talked to customers, all of those things to help validate that we were uh, on the right track, uh, validated that, that yeah, for the most part, our, our ideas um, made sense. And with that, we created this product owner excellence program where we got to know you uh, as well. And the idea there was to, was to really set the new standard for product ownership and product management in our company and really make it a strategic differentiator as we created this new company. Yeah. And, and uh, when I got to know you a bit, um, the, the parallels between uh, Epiroc and Lego were pretty strong. You both make a lot of trucks, um, but you both decided that offering just the same old truck wasn't enough and that you needed to innovate around the truck if you were really going to um, continue to grow and profit as a company. Right. Um, that was a challenge, though, for people in the company and in particular, um, uh, probably for the product managers, wasn't it? I mean, because you're asking these people who before had a relatively limited role to step up and be, take a much larger role. Um, how did you help them with that? Yeah. So the, the, you know, I think the idea, what we saw before was it was kind of this very technical role. Uh, when we, when you looked at it, it was very technical and I do technical things. Uh, I would say the role even blurred, is it a, is it a, R and D engineering role, or is it a is it something else that we thought it should be something else? And so, uh, you know, the the first thing we had to do was was really make it clear that we had this ambition to change. I think that's the first is let's just be really clear that we do want to do this differently to everybody, uh, and then and we're going to have a program that helps us get there together and do this successfully. And so that was the goal with that. And of course, you know, like you said, we can't. We, we still have to protect the core. You know, we still have these products that are core, even if it is a dumb iron, it still is core and it still is very relevant. And so how do you do that and still maintain to protect the core? So we, we put this program together. It involved um, a lot of different aspects. It was around tools and templates to help support the work. Uh, it was around uh, leadership and culture and, and how do we make sure that we have this culture that talks openly uh, around what it, what good looks like in this range. Uh, how do we recruit people that want to work this way? You know, because that that is if if in the past the idea was hire really technical people to only do technical things, you have to change your recruitment strategy. And then we put together what I think was a pretty robust training program to give new skills beyond just the technical side. And so when you look at our training program, it was the technical side was covered. We had to develop something that covered all of the other things and gave them these tools to be able to, to do that. And, and so then the training program really helped to address that for the individuals. And the ambition was anybody that falls in product management, portfolio management, whatever job title falls under that is going to be a part of this. And the expectation we set is you need to act like you're the CEO of your product. You need to have a strategy, ensure that it's going to thrive. And if your product is one small piece of a bigger product, you act that way. If you're responsible for the whole portfolio, you act that way. Uh, and we're a fairly decentralized company. So this idea of pushing uh, ownership and accountability and freedom with accountability, uh, we say the closest people to the problem are the best ones to solve it. So the idea of doing that was kind of in our culture already, but we had to put a little like steroids on it uh, in terms of this program to really make that happen. So one more question, then I want to kind of open it up to the audience and see what questions they have. But um, give us an example of a product that you've gotten from this, this new structure that you wouldn't have gotten from your old structure. Uh, yeah, so I think this idea, you know, of innovating around the box, Dave, that, that you, you worked with us on, and also avoiding the disease of more, you know, the idea of disease of more is oh, this drill was great. Let's build another drill that's kind of like that, but slightly bigger. And then another build that's kind of like that, but slightly smaller. And then let's build another one that's kind of like that, but, but yellow. Uh, and I think we had some of that going on. And so first of all, I think culturally with the program, we, we stopped doing that. And so if you look at the products that have come out since then, they've all been touched by it, I think, in some way or another. Uh, we have some specific examples. And so every, uh, every four years, there's a big... Uh, expo called Mine Expo, and, and all the mining companies display their equipment, uh, uh, equipment manufacturers, mining companies from all over the world. And 
I was there in our booth and, and one of the guys from the program came up and he, and he said, I need to talk to you. And he walked me over to an undercarriage, which, which tracks uh, an undercarriage uh, that would go like on a dozer, a set of tracks, which is part of a bigger system, uh, but a really important system because it allows us to move and in particular in an autonomous scenario. And he said, do you see this undercarriage? I said, yeah. And um, it looked like most undercarriages. And he said, I want to show you what's different about this undercarriage. So he walked me around the undercarriage and he said, we are going to fix a lot of problems that we have in terms of our drill automation and what we can do with undercarriage with moving it around because of what I learned in the product owner excellence program. You know, I, I got tools that helped me to, to lead the way to develop this piece of this bigger system. Um, and, and, and I think we have stories like that all over the place. The other thing we've learned is uh, with our products themselves in this idea of, you know, innovate around the box is being really clear. What is the box? What innovations can happen around the box? And how do you think about developing the new box, the new uh, core that's going to be coming down as well? And, and really being deliberate and distinguished about we have to develop new cores and new boxes. Those are a little long term, but we also have to innovate around the box today. So uh, we have ambitions to, uh, for example, safety. Safety is always a top priority. Uh, there's some really uh, cool ambitions out there in the industry. And we have several products that have come out as part of this attitude of, of of uh, a design around the box that that have come as a result of that. So I think generally the culture is there, and really I think almost every product as we've started to do this is touched by it in some way or another. And we just see a higher success rate as well with those products. We have technology. Uh, if you look in our automation program, uh, changing a bit, which is a procedure and drilling hole. It used to be manual. It's a safety issue because of the program. Uh, People said, hey, we can come up with a better way to do this without overcomplicating it. Came up with a really cool design that made that happen as well. Right. Thank, thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at the questions now. Uh, Jorge Tenorio asked a question about network intermittences or satellite connections. Uh, I think we'll, we'll skip over kind of the technical stuff because I want to stay focused on the innovation management. Um, Patricio Hildago asks about, uh, does this... Uh, lets you pivot into new uh, industries such as say agriculture or new markets like uh, emerging markets like um, uh, Los Andes, South America. Um, how, uh, how has this helped you in terms of your uh, expansion outside of your core? So I think, um, you know, if, you, if we decide to pivot in terms of industry, that's a big strategic decision for EpiRock, right? So that decision probably isn't going to be uh, it, it's not going to be determined by this group, but I think what, what would happen is if we were to, to do that, we would say we have this program and this tool set that, it, that we think is a strategic advantage that helps us to be successful in that. Um, maybe, maybe tying to the question a little bit there that, that happens, I think, realistically is we're going to acquire a company that doesn't take us into a new industry, but takes us maybe one step away from our core but still near to core of where we are today. How do you, how do you acquire that company and, and bring value to that company that helps it to thrive? And I think that's where this program, you know, when you can translate here is a way that we do product portfolio management and here's how we think about innovation. It, it ends up being something that you bring in terms of, of, a, of a synergy that, that would be difficult to quantify, but is a synergy that you can bring into a company and say, this is how, uh, one EpiRock, one acquisition, you add them together, they make three, not two, right? That's one of the, the benefits of a program like this. Uh, and I will say, you know, again, with this idea that we learned from, from you, Dave, this, this idea of innovate around the box, this program itself became a box. And so the, to this question of, does it help you if you're going to pivot into other things? So now we have a product owner excellence program and we said, wow, that looked pretty, that worked pretty good. And, and look at what happened. Um, we actually then did a business owner excellence program. And these are the people that are closer to the customers. And we took a lot of material from this. We took the same framework, innovated around this box to create a business owner excellence program, which now is more people that are closer to the customers and, and running those business closer to the customers. And then we did a human resource excellence program and we have a finance excellence program. And so I think all of those things, when you figure it out, help you to to do more, whether it's pivot to an industry or just uh, 
uh, have a strategic differentiator, acquire a company, go into a new market, uh, then then yeah, all of that all of that helps for sure. And it's and and starting with this and doing that has really helped a lot. Yeah, uh, and just uh, for the audience, um, when John talks about innovating uh, around the box, uh, that's a the term we use in in uh, the program here at MIT. Uh, that you can innovate inside the box, outside the box, or around the box. And Epiroc has become really outstanding at um, really all three of those, um, that they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, that it's, it's important to look in all three of those directions. So inside the box, of course, is just making your current product for your current customer better and better. And I would argue that that's the most important type of innovation for any company, that, that you want to continue making your core product really as good as anybody else's, if not better. Um, but if that's all you do, then often your competitors match you and become a commodity and you start spinning out variants, what John referred to as the disease of more, and you start getting a lot of complexity in your manufacturing and supply chain and everybody's miserable. Um, and so what companies often do then is innovate outside the box. So they pursue revolutionary disruptive innovations. And those are important, right? I mean, electrifying your vehicles uh, may have seemed at one point to be a really revolutionary disruptive innovation, and it was, but it was a uh, kind of in many ways a no-brainer once batteries got to a certain level. And so really using some new technology in some important way is something that every company has to do, but it tends to be expensive, risky, and difficult um, and fails a lot. And so the third type that uh, Epiroc is a master at is, is this uh, around the box. So what else can you do for your current customers with your current products? And the things that you've talked about of automation and, and um, reporting and uh, remote control and, 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 right? and, and complementary products and services are uh, great. And, um, and all that is a way to kind of get to, uh, to Jake's question about uh, the, the uh, financial modeling of this, that sometimes the biggest barrier to this can be the accountants in the company, that uh, you have lots of different innovations. And if they're each their separate P&L, then all of a sudden you've got something you know, over in one part of the company that you may actually want to lose money on to make more money somewhere else. And so how do you manage this? Uh, you know, what's an expense? What's a profit center? How do you think about the P&L? How did that change when you started this approach? How did, how was, how did you manage that within Epiroc? So I think overall the company, you know, we, we have some, what I'll call really good discipline uh, in the company uh, overall. And this is some, this is part of our 140 year old her heritage at, at being, uh, you know, profitable for a long time as we, you know, we have some embedded discipline that, that uh, when you work in the company, you learn about. Uh, and for the most part, good. I think there's, there's certain times that, that maybe it can hold you back. But what was really important is, is actually the, the first part of the training program for product owner excellence is understanding financial implications. So being technical, really important, but understanding the consequences of technical decisions, also important. And the consequences from a financial perspective uh, is is actually one of the things that we said, you know, we can develop great things all day long, but if they cost a lot and don't make us money, or if we don't think about the business model uh, proactively, you know, they're not sustainable. And and, and we, what we're after is sustainability. So, so part of that, when we did our assessment, the first step that we do is everybody, you know, you don't have to have a business degree, you don't have to have an MBA, but everybody that goes through the program is going to understand the pieces of a PL and how decisions impact different parts of the PL so that you can have that discussion of, I'm going to do this and I need to think, how does this impact other areas and how does it? Because if you if you make decisions and totally ignore the PL, sometimes it can be a pretty big path to going broke. And so, so you do have to have it in the back of your mind that this has to fit in. Then we can have that discussion of, are we willing to give this for free? Because we know that once that goes out there, this is going to be really profitable and these are going to go together. And as a whole, this is a really good business. And so then we can, then we can have that discussion and, and, you know, then we can even challenge each other is that, does that business model make sense or not? Um, and, and we always say, one of the great things about being a profitable company is you always have money to try different things. If you're not profitable, you don't have as money, as much money to try different things. And so, we do have a little bit of that freedom that we can actually go out there and say, I have this idea. I think it'll work. Let's go try it, succeed or fail. But you'll also pull back 
early enough if it's a failure and, and readjust. But holistically, in the end, we, we still want it to be good for EpiRock. And as long as we keep in mind, I understand how technical decisions and portfolio decisions impact potentially the, the business aspects and the financial aspects of this. And we do the right thing for EpiRock, the KPIs all fall in place. And so that's why we cover the, the financial piece as part of this. So whether they like it or not, everybody that goes through the program, the first thing they start with is, is understanding how your decisions impact the financial parts of the company. And we have a really great way of doing that. Everybody that goes through it comes out and says, wow, I didn't think finance and business could be that cool. And so we, we really put a lot of effort into making sure for very technical group, people who want to do cool technical things came out of it, understanding the business side and saying, oh, that's kind of cool too. You know, we've talked some about um, the change in the product manager role to be more of a product owner and CEO of the product and the challenges of, of that increased level of responsibility and stepping up to it. But there's the other end of the challenge, which is uh, the, the senior management that all of a sudden they have to manage those people differently. How did you manage that transition? Yeah. So I think on that side, I'd say we're still in the transition, actually, you know, even though we're a few years into this, Dave, I think we're still into that. When, when you have the ambition to do something like this, I think you have to acknowledge you, you are, uh, you are making a cultural change. And, and I think you do have to acknowledge that and, and plan for it to be a cultural change. The best way to do that is to start and make sure that your, your leadership uh, is on board with this. Uh, so we did that. You know, we started, we, we actually invited you in and a few others to essentially do a, a, a micro version of the program for our leadership to make sure they understood it. You know, leadership, I mean, like executives, senior executives, do they understand it? Can they endorse it? And, and uh, that was that was a very, very early step. Um, well, you know, what we and then and then what we go through is trying to make we make sure that the leaders of these people that go through the program will then support them because they come out of the program and, and you know, they're really energized actually to, to work this way. And if their leader doesn't support them, then it's a pretty fast path to the way we used to do it. So we also work with the leaders and we do that a couple of different ways to make sure that they will help to endorse and support this as it happens. Um, you know, we're, we're more successful in areas than others that in that area. And I think we're still in that. That's why I say we're still in this transition because we have some leaders that, you know, this comes in and they're all on board, they embrace it. And they're like, okay, let's all go do all these new things together. And we have some that are a little more conservative and slower, I would say, to, to really adopt and bring in all of the new ways of working. And so that's, uh, that's something that we still, every time we do this program, we have a leadership component or how do we help the leadership also move forward and support the people that are coming out of this program? And, and it's still part of the journey. It's a cultural shift in how we work. Someday, all the people who have been through this program and loved it are going to be those leaders and those managers, and they're going to uh, very quickly make this part of the culture. But we're still, depending on the part of our business, still transitioning in some cases there. Laura Donna asked a question in chat. And by the way, I'm, I'm only loosely monitoring chat. I'm more honoring... Uh, monitoring the Q&A uh, box. So if you have a question, put it in Q&A. But Laura Donna's question is a really interesting one that you've talked about uh, how acquisitive you are, how uh, many companies you've acquired, but how do you think about um, as, you, as you try to uh, create a, a complete solution for your customers, how do you decide whether to partner or to acquire or to simply you know, buy from a vendor? How do you make that big decision? make or buy decision so, or yeah we decision. so we actually have you know i've worked on a on a few acquisitions and we actually have a pretty robust process where we actually go through that line of thinking you know you know first of all what i think you start with your strategy what is it that we need to accomplish and then you look at what are the paths for us to get there and i think we we have a pretty robust way to do that uh, that that comes from from our, some of this was one of the good things we brought with our company from from atlas copco and so I think we stay pretty true to that, uh, that way of working in that process. It's, it's worked for us. And, and a part of that is looking, okay, is this something we should do internally? Because we can invest money. We have software developers. We have data experts. You know, we, we have a lot of expertise internally. Should we do this internally and make that robust? Um, should we partner with a company? Should we acquire a minority stake in a company? Should we acquire... Uh, majority stake, should we acquire an entire company? And so 
all of that um, is part of that, that process, but it ties very much to the strategy, which helps us get to the strategy with the timing that we have in mind. Because sometimes you need to go, you need to go fast and you just have to go get something that's already on the market or go look. And then of course, the other side is what's really available. You know, what partnerships are really available, what acquisitions are really available. So all of that has to play into it. Um, you know, and we do pretty well. We certainly have, uh, we, we, I think we have some that we say, okay, we would have done that differently, but I think overall uh, we do it pretty well. And I'm, I'm being a little vague on the details because it is a bit of a confidential uh, recipe. It is a secret sauce that we have in the company, but that, that we, it is pretty robust in how we do that. Um, and, and because it is so far a pretty successful recipe, uh, we stick with it, we revisit it, we adjust it, it makes sense. But so far it's, it's a pretty, pretty good recipe. Um, Ankor asked the question about uh, really part of your core business, that um, there is a lot of pressure to reduce carbon, to use green energy um, for every industry, but especially industries uh, that are large emitters like the mining industry and construction industry. Um, so uh, your core has a lot of pressure to change. How does this help or hinder that? Yeah, I think, you know, that's, it's going to change. I think the, the, so I think EpiRock Atlas Copco, and, and I'm going to say it's maybe because they were a Swedish company. Again, I think Swedish companies tend to be more progressive on, on this. And so I think uh, in terms of our industries, I think we were talking about it uh, maybe before the, the industry was pulling it through us. Um, and, and I think that's, again, my impression, uh, Swedish companies and, and what they, just how they look at things. And, and this was something we have to work on this. Uh, and so we, we were working on it uh, already. I think now the industry is really pulling. And when the industry is pulling, that, that's a good thing because then they're, they're willing to pay for it. They've, they've set it as a priority. And so uh, it is going to change. I mean, I, I, um, I'm traveling this week. And one of the reasons I'm traveling is partially uh, uh, a, a decarbonization uh, discussion that I'm participating in. And, and, and the other side is, you know, automation is, is really cool and great. But as you look at how you get there and you look at what I'll say is, you know, what we need to do is do more of this work with less energy. How do you do that? And, and so the autonomous piece becomes really important into this because uh, with automation, with a robot, you can just get such tighter controls over the usage of the energy and, and how you're going to use that energy. And then that you part, you can couple that with battery power or a cable, you know, whatever it is you decide to do. But when you put these together, uh, you can actually make an impact. I think the good thing, you know, I've been in this industry my whole life. Um, I think the good thing is to see that there's a lot of commitment from the mining industry in particular to be better at this. Um, and so it is going to change. Uh, it 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 is changing, and, and it is going to change. So hopefully that answers the question. But it, but it's it, in terms of our portfolio and our products, we have brought ex we we've brought in expertise. And if you look at the acquisitions, some of the acquisitions we've made, we we've made acquisitions that are enablers to decarbonized mines or to to lower. CO2 mines. And so that's in the form of companies that can help do electrical infrastructure, can help with battery power, all of those things, if you look at some of our acquisitions as well to make that happen. So uh, Windsor Cho asked a couple of questions, but I want to just focus on one of them, which is the, the length of your innovation and development cycle. Um, it can be pretty long for some of these. Uh, how do you know you're doing the right thing, <laughs> right? I mean, if it's a four-year cycle. And you're uh, yeah. only a couple of years into this change. How do you know that? Yeah, uh, so it kind of, right so one of, the, one of the ambitions with this project or with the Product Owner Excellence Initiative was to speed up the innovation cycle. And so, um, you know, we, that, that was one of it is, is how can you speed that up? And so there's different things that we tried to do that do there. And I think uh, part of it is making sure that you do have this, this culture, this strategy that, that looks at like you said, within the box, around the box. And uh, because that helps you speed up, right? There are things you can do that help you address tomorrow, but you also have to be thinking about the things that you're going to do next month and next year. Uh, and so, yeah, the challenging ones are where you have to try to predict the future. And uh, I think there you, you try to get the insight that you can. Uh, you try to understand where your customers see it going, uh, what they are seeing as their priorities for the future. 
And uh, then you you have to make some smart investments on where you think it's going to go. And uh, yeah, it, I think again there, if, if you're a company that has the money to do that, you can look at two or three different paths uh, and and test those three different paths. But usually, in terms of big development, you know, usually it's it's uh, we will look out there and the speed of the industry. We can usually uh, roll out what I call big big change products, changes in terms of change, you know, the core um, at a speed that does tend to go at the speed of the industry as well. Um, what I will say is I think this switch to battery powered and all of that happened in the mining industry pretty fast by, by standards of how that industry typically moves. And so, so yeah, finding ways to adjust to that. Uh, again, you, you look at where can I invest for the short term to help get closer, but then we have to make some long-term bets. And, and again, some of these acquisitions that we make, anticipating where it's going to be. And I think at the same time, you know, we really stay focused on a strategy. If we have a good strategy that, 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 that's based on good fundamentals, good assessments, if we follow our strategy, then, then you know, we're going to have a lot of good hits along the way. It's, it, we're not going to have too many foul balls. Uh, and, and that tends tends to work. We have a we have a pretty good success rate there. Well, John, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for being so open about uh, what Epiroc is doing and and uh, the difficulties, but also the successes of it. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Likewise, thanks for having me. And uh, now it's it's time for the kind of uh, shameless plug portion uh, that. Uh, uh, here at MIT, we we do a program about innovating around the box. Uh, how do you respect your current products for your current customers, but then also realize that it may not be enough to get the kind of growth and profits you need? How do you also uh, create a structure and process for um, creating complete solutions for your current customers and your current products? Um, the uh, There is a QR code you can scan here. Uh, the next running of the program will be on campus, uh, September 15th and 16th. That's next month. Um, and we hope you can join us.